Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the fourth lecture in the Gender and the Prosperity Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Yuan He, an Associate Lecturer at the Institute for Global Prosperity, UCL. It is our great honor today to host this lecture delivered by Samaya Tarapatan in person from the UCL Lecture Hall. This opportunity feels so precious to many of us after two years of travel restrictions and social distance due to the pandemic. Standing on the same podium with the guest speaker who works on Myanmar and teaches at American University still feels unreal. Um, Tara Patan is currently associate professor at Northern Illinois University. She received her PhD from the history department of SOAS in London. And I wonder whether SOAS did us a favor in bringing you here or not. Um, I did send out the event information to SOAS as a guest of gratitude, as a gesture of gratitude, and I hope Tarapa may find some old friends in the audience. Uh, when I was organizing this lecture series, I really wanted to cover some underrepresented regions in Asia. And Samaya Tan, uh, Tarapa Tan's work on women in Myanmar is so unique and intellectually refreshing. When I was promoting this event, via an email to the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies based in Singapore, who has a renowned Myanmar Studies program. The program leader told me that he is also a big fan of Tarapa. Samaya Tarapa's book, Women in Modern Myanmar, challenges the popular notion of Burmese women as free and liberated. By reassessing the social, economic, and the political positions of women in modern Burma, during the 20th century, she argues that the national framework of historical writing or the official histories has defended the privileged positions of Burmese women who have been portrayed as powerful agents. While in reality, Burmese women experienced little freedom. She made this argument by exploring the world of female soldiers, guerrilla fighters, politicians, writers, and prostitutes using a variety of public and private material. She is currently working on feminism, dissent, and the rise, rise riots. She works pro bono for the newly founded Virtual Federal University, an education portal providing alternative education to Myanmar students resisting the coup regime. So without further ado, let's welcome Samaya Tarapai to deliver the lecture today, titled, Is There Such a Thing? as being my feminism. Thank you, Professor Yuan He, for inviting me um, to give a talk here. Like you said, it is a real privilege to be able to see the students and audience in person after two years. So today's lecture is titled, Is There Such a Thing as Myanmar Feminism? And um, I dedicate today's talk to those fallen and have sacrificed in many revolutions of Burma or Myanmar. And I benefited from my conversations and writings with two feminists in Myanmar, Biola Han and Shonle. Um, the title of today's talk is intended to be provocative. The emphasis is on feminism. And the question is how we can understand and study feminism in Myanmar context. When we hear the word feminism, we often associate it with the first, second, and third waves of feminism as understood in the West. Feminists and feminist scholars come looking for feminism or women's movements in Burma or Myanmar, equipped with the language and examples they are familiar with. Then many get lost trying to identify 
what could be fitted under the umbrella term feminism in Myanmar context. There are no clear answers to where women organized or did women mobilize themselves and the whole country for women's rights to vote. The question based on the understanding of the first wave feminism, or are women allowed to work or are women in Myanmar paid equally as men? The question from the second wave, or are women subject to domestic violence? How is sexual libera liberation viewed by women? A question from the third wave. Asking these questions in Myanmar context could easily disorient a uh, feminist scholar. It is not because there is no such thing as Myanmar feminism, but the waves of feminist movements did not all occur in a linear fashion or waves as understood in the West. All the preconditions set for feminist movements to emerge are very different from the Western context. So the question then is, what is Myanmar feminism or rather how we can understand feminism in Myanmar context? What are the structural op oppressions or patriarchal norms Burmese women fight, fight against? Why is feminism on the rise in 2021? So my talk today will be guided by these three questions. The question number one and number two are interrelated. To be able to answer these questions, I will give you a brief historical background on Burmese women. Burma's first election was held in 1922. Women who owned properties could vote to elect 80 out of 103 members in the Legislative Council. As part of the British India, Burmese women's voting rights were considered the same as women in Britain, where ratepayers were able to vote. But in 1922, the historical trajectory of women's rights was very different from the British woman or those in the countries where women's agency was tied to whether or not they could elect a man or woman using their own ballots or vice. In the 19th century, Burmese women were holding 10% of the village administrative positions and owned properties in their names. Head men and head woman positions were passed down by both male and female hereditary lines and women inherited head woman positions. If 10% of women could govern in rural areas of the plains and matriarchal communities existed in highlands, sending someone to offices in their stead by voting could be seen as a step down or a step backward. In this context, women did not mobilize, nor were they mobilized for elections and voting. In colonial global south, feminism movements all, are often intertwined with the independence movements. One of the earliest women movements in Burma or Myanmar was around household tax, not for voting rights. As the British administrative organs became expensive and tax regimes became more restricting, on economic activities of rural households, nationalist political organizations mobilized their members, both men and women, around the issue of tax. So women joined women wings of such political parties, and they called them, they called themselves Kumari and they participated in and led boycott movements. They did not pay tax, boycotted the imported products, including sheer fabrics and tortoise shell combs. Since the Burmese term for the shell include the same term late as in English. This early movement and the term Kumari put the feminist movement in the realm of the independence movement as part of the British India. The Mari movement was also an early indication of how women's movements in Myanmar have always been subsumed by larger national movements. And like many countries, particularly those in the global north, where generations of women in the 20th century did not participate in the independence or liberation struggle, Burmese women's struggle have always lived in the shadows of the national movements. National in Burmese language has been translated as concerning men or men's causes. 
not concerning the nation or concerning the state. And such a linguistic oversight highlights why Burmese women find it almost impossible to launch their own movement or participate in national causes. Nation's cause is what everyone, man and woman together has to strive for. And it will be selfish and insecure of women to fight for their own causes. Once everyone is freed, women will be freed. Woman's predic predicament is bound up with everybody's predicament. Such a coupling of women's causes with the national causes and describing national causes as men's causes or the ones men should lead poses the greatest challenge for women's movements and women activists. Women political leaders learn to adopt the strategy of adopting men's or national causes as theirs to survive in a hostile political environment. Gomari women were active in Windanu movement, meaning love for one's race. And women's niche in the independent struggle has been carved out by monks and men. Taking inspirations from Gandhian movement, Windanu Gomari women art fellow women to support local products and encourage women to produce their own clothes. At the same time, Wives of their silver servants launched their elite activism, supporting orphanages and organizing pansy days, that is the fundraising activities in government schools and offices. What roles women could adopt in the independent struggle as well as in welfare activism had long been defined by the religious, cultural and political leaders. Most of them are male. Women students actively participated in the student strikes from 1910 to 1938, the last of which was launched to show solidarity with oil strikers who were marching from the oil fee of dry zone to government offices in Rangoon or Yango. Here, the white, um, you see the picture of uh, women and young girls picketing in front of the factory gates. When the oil work workers went on strike, this picture of young girls and women throwing their bodies across the factory gates of oil refineries captured the nation's imagination. They were like their sisters before, during the Komari movement, portrayed, they were portrayed as supporters of the national movement. And irony is that many of the demands that oil workers made were demands to improve the living conditions in the house and for the families. Family plight, such as children of the oil fee workers not having to use oil to burn for their studies at night was connected to the colonial exploitation of the locals. Since women were seen as supporters of the national movements, Individual women champions rather than women's movements for specific women causes emerge. So here is a picture of uh, Domya saying. So during the first third of the 20th century, highly educated women like her, um, and she represented the country at Burma Roundtable Conference in London in 1931. Um, and she was the first Burmese woman to graduate from Oxford University. So women like her overshadowed other um, Burmese women, other less privileged women. The two interesting trends emerge regarding women's movements. First, women were framed as supporters by the nationalists and agitators by the colonialists in the independent struggle. Women played the second fiddle after the male nationalist leaders and nationalist monks. The second trend is the individual woman from Dom Yasin to Aung San Suu Kyi represented Burmese women. And they were generally regarded as um, representatives of all Burmese women. Highly educated women like them are rare in Burma, but they attracted disproportionate attention eschewing the real political, social, and cultural positions of women. 
historically, Gwynch and Sobu, the picture that I show um, a few slides ago, had women and women educated at Oxford universities. Uh, Oxford University perpetuated the message that Burmese women enjoyed a high status in society. In reality, young girls and women face more hardship than boys and men, and they do not enjoy equal status at all. For example, girls dropout rate is higher than that of boys and men, men, uh, men earn more than women. Lowest paid jobs, most of them are in the government sector, uh, are secured by women. So to go back to our first question of where, what is Myanmar feminism or rather how can we understand feminism in Myanmar context? Uh, feminism cannot be understood separately from other movements. Women themselves feel deeply uncomfortable portraying themselves as feminists or merely fighting for their own causes. When interviewing women doctors and soldiers, they refuse to talk about working for women causes. In fact, they often view their own activism as politically neutral. Feminism is inherently political and the fact that Burmese activism or women activism has been depoliticized mm -hmm. since the 1960s, contributed to men and women depoliticizing their works or downplaying their activism. Two examples stood out. A leading Burmese woman doctor was quite angry at me when I described her who worked working for the poor and steady in politics before joining the medical school as radical. Women getting attention and talking about their politics was a radical act. Between Dom Yasin and Dong San Suu Kyi, there were hardly any women who could lead both women and men and carve out political careers or activism for women. So that was the first example. The second example was that of women soldiers. They were originally recruited to establish the first woman army, but they mostly spent the war time in a supporting role nursing soldiers and mobilizing the rural public against the Japanese. After the war, they all changed their military uniforms to civilian clothes and in their own words, buried their political lives. It is worth emphasizing again that depoliticizing women's activism silences women and women in turn adopted non-political lives at, after a period of political activism. A continued pursuit of political activism was and still is almost impossible, but there is a clear demarcation between what men could do and what women could and should do. Studying feminism or understanding feminism in Myanmar context then requires one to pay attention to larger political and social landscape in which women situate themselves. This this leads us to answer the second question. What are the structural opposition, oppressions or patriarchal norms Burmese women fight against? How women situate themselves tells us different structural oppressions and patriarchal norms under which women operate or organize their movements. So these are some popular images um, of um, women in the socialist period that I'm going to talk about. In Burmese politics, the biggest impediment for women political activism is the mainstream or party politics or framing politics as uh, the one that men could excel or the, men, the one that works uh, in the um, parliamentary or the, uh, the, the systems organized uh, by men. So women political leaders retired from politics or they operated in the opposition either through underground communist movements or in armed organizations such as Korean National Unions or the Burma Communist Party. In the Burma Socialist Program Party, BSPP, there were no senior women executives. Wives of socialist leaders championed social welfare causes. Even during the three nationwide workers and farmers conferences the Socialist Party organized 
in the early years of their power did not feature a single woman speaker. Women were largely absent in the rank and file of Socialist Party. Out of all five historical periods in modern Burma, from the independence movement in early 20th century to the democratic period from 1948 to 1962, to the Burma Socialist Program Party period from 1962 to 1988, and to the military dictatorships from 1988 to 2011, and the experiential diarchic arrangement between the democratic government and the military. B so out of all these five periods, BSPP and the military dictatorships witnessed the lowest woman participation in politics. Earlier politically active generations of women had also retired from politics or those wanted to engage in politics found a refuge in armed organizations because mainstream politics or the party politics shut their doors on women. Deterring women from joining politics went hand in hand with carving out careers and roles for women in the society. In the education programs during the democratic period under the name in Burmese, creating new life and education, but called the education plan for welfare state in English language, women teachers were described as frontier soldiers. There was a push for women to be soldiers with chops and not combat soldiers in a traditional army or in a guerrilla army. There was also an ambivalent attitude from the part of the government about the role of women in the society. Since the government encouraged women to join army and women pilots like this one were occasionally featured on magazine covers. Inspiring young men with the pictures of women soldiers, especially pilots, has been a method many government use, yet these poster soldiers were never given a combat role. Equity and equal opportunities for men and women, even in the army, started and entered on magazine covers. Besides the government uh, that was unable to articulate and create women roles in the administration or other sectors in the country, gendered roles society create uh, impede individual and collective progress of women. Healthcare and education are considered suitable professions for women, and more women compete for spaces in healthcare. Women have to score higher than men to be accepted in a medical school. Engineering is considered a men's profession and to be able to, admit, to, be, able to be admitted to an engineering school, women have to score higher as well. Either way, women are doomed. Parents think teaching job is dignified and suitable for women and the uniform gives protection to women. They therefore encourage their daughters to strive to become teachers. Government jobs are poorly paid and it is often hard to juggle with families. Many women professors at universities remain unmarried for two reasons. One, they cannot support their own families with the salaries. And second, to rise higher in an academy, one must devote one's life to pursuing one degree after another, writing one paper after another, leaving one with no time to find a partner. So about 10% of jobs remain in the government sector and majority of women engage in trade, which has traditionally been considered a woman's world. So if 10, uh, only 10% of the country's jobs are in the government sector, you know, so a lot of women are uh, found in the streets, uh, in the market, working alongside men as traders. A Buddhist understanding of what men and women can achieve differently in a secular world helps explain why Burmese women are not discouraged, if not encouraged, to engage in trading. Men are supposed to spend more time accumulating merits towards Nirvana and, if possible, enter Mankuk. But even women traders have glassed in. National level trading associations have more men members and men leaders than women. Women might be managing big businesses, but when their businesses are brought into guilds or conglomerates, it is men, not women, who are chosen to represent businesses.
Women, though entirely competent and excel in running a business, are discouraged, often through bureaucratic hurdles and mistrust by men in associations to run for offices, be they in trade or politics. So politics and bureaucracy and gendering of them, that is laboring them as men's world, remain the biggest obstacles for women. Having few powerful women who come from political fathers and husbands in the government obfuscates the real powerlessness of majority of Burmese women. Ordinary women from farmers to housewives find government officials, government services, and government positions inaccessible to them. Yola Han and Hilary Faxon wrote that majority of women farmers do not have land titles in their names. In other words, many women working on land do not own it since the bureaucratic process is complicated and offices are hostile places for women to visit. Official land owning title enables people to be recognized in a formal role and the lack of land ownership resulted in women being unable to envision themselves as farmers let alone landed farmers. The word farmer or ledama in Burmese is exclusively for men. And like in politics, women merely enjoy supporting roles also in farming, such as transplanters, weeders, and harvesters. As more and more young men are leaving the country, often to do the same farming jobs, but on the soil of Thailand, Women have additional roles besides managing the house. Though many are far, farmers themselves and farming uh, alone on their farms, a common picture of a person tilling the land either with water buffaloes or machine is still in the image of man and not in women. No poster with women tilling the land has been issued either by the, by the government or NGOs to capture the empower, uh, empowerment of women. So I have talked about the visible barriers such as government structures and bureaucratic barriers for women to visit and hold positions in power. But there also exists in, invisible barriers within local cultures and those from without. One of them is the concept of poem, that is prestige and power afforded to men. The belief that women are inherently inferior to men because women did not accumulate enough karmic credits in their past lives contributes to everyday actions such as families separating women's undergarments from men's clothes in doing the laundry. And women cannot go to higher precincts in pagodas and religious buildings. Politics and the concept of poem trap women in women-only jobs and make them landless and titleless. Power holders, including the army, uses or rather misuses and abuses cultural norms and beliefs to their advantage. They reinforce the superiority of male through unproven narratives from Zataka or lives of Buddha. Inferiority of men, women, sorry, inferiority of women and propagation of messages and actions help men entrench their power in the governance. There, this insidious dual play of politics and poem is difficult to unravel. So here it is what pointing out that the rather dangerous side of the Western interventions of feminism and feminist methods. Myanmar feminism is not easily visible and between 2010 to 2020, when many gender-based funding becomes available, many women activists felt pressure to be seen and visible so that their work could be seen or interpreted as feminist work or their work, their activism, gender activism. Deviating from the previous activists who in the 1950s to 1980s joined the ethnic armed organizations or the Communist Party of Burma and in late 1980s to early 2000s in Burma Thai borders, 
Many activists between 2010 to 2020 found space in urban politics and urban activism. But except for ethnic armed organizations, uh, affiliated women organizations, many women organizations prioritize change from the parliamentary system. Culture becomes more prominent and visible as an obstacle for change when the military handed power over to the civilian governments after 2010 and 2015 elections. Domestic violence becomes a common cause that could rally many women organizations. 16-day activism provides a by-sides activism to those who cannot be full-time activists. Gender-based violence reports and steps uh, to tackle them were widely discussed from the government to community level. Vaginal monologues and even the term feminism becomes more accepted towards the end of 2010s. Using universal benchmarks and popular global trends, white ribbon campaign, Me Too movement, uh, so all of these emerge in Myanmar. But these urban-based NGO-driven gender group activism was detached from ethnic armed organizations, women's movements, which continuously pointed out that entrenched military rule ended the civilian government and precarity of women's lives ended. So they, the urban activism was isolated or detached from these um, minority women's movements. Women's movements or feminist movements in the 2010s were subsumed by universal women or feminist movements and gender equity by and large center around liberation from domestic violence and more women representation in politics. Emphasis is on the individual freedom and individual achievement and collective liberation is considered unpragmatic at best and unachievable within the short project cycles. Women's movements could not champion farmers or garment workers movements where women fought for land rights and fair pay, fair pay. So I will end my second section on the challenges on Myanmar or Burmese feminism here. To recap, politics, bureaucracy and project-based activism disempower women activists who fought for collective liberation around non-women issues such as land rights and fair pay. Tunnel vision of global or Western feminism that has been institutionalized to see voting rights, sexual liberation, and Western NGOs uh, who are reluctant to support movements. Um, so what these uh, universal um, indicators um, and then organizations working to meet these benchmarks are reluctant to support local movements that do not have these hashtags. Tensions arises uh, when one attempts to see the feminist movement um, in the local language or in the, um, on the local terms. Um, that is separated or independent of the main national movements, be they Burman-centered or NGO-driven. The third and last section of today's talk is the rise of um, feminism in the aftermath, uh, aftermath of the coup and the factors that enable it. So this is the last and the, um, the third section of the talk. So politics that straddles the radical politics, that is the one that deviates from the mainstream popular or elite politics supported by majority has been born out of the coup. The coup proves beyond doubt that diarchic relationship between the military and the leading party did not work. Radical voices and politics and radical politics were brought to the fore in the abrupt opening of the political space. Feminism in the context of Myanmar is radical politics because it highlights the fact that if women are not freed, society, society is not freed. For the first time in Myanmar modern history, the 2021 revolution saw the 
centering of women's issues and calls. Um, so this is uh, and, presented, and presented. Uh, so I will show you a few pictures of uh, the so picture a few pictures from the uh, revolution. So this is a picture of uh, garment workers um, protesting. So they formed the largest group uh, and they came out first on the 6th of February after the coup. So because of them, the protests uh, and the street protests started. Now, without their participation, it will be hard to see um, the emergence of street uh, protests. So in the era of social media and instant news, women's participation in politics and their activism from the cities and the countryside, from the plains to highlands is visible. Um, their voices emerge and filtered and, and censored. So these are some of the pictures uh, depicting uh, woman participation in the uh, revolution. Varied women's activism uh, from, or various women's activism from icing a woman's sarongs in downtown, marching with slogans, I will wear what I want, just don't break me, to women discreetly preparing explosive materials for the local resistance forces. And city women demonstrating as war refugees holding young children to draw the attention to the minorities. So all of these pictures erase the question of whether or not women should belong in politics. Raptured politics made feminism uh, visible. So these are the pictures taken before the coup. So these are women voters, you know, proudly showing their ink little fingers to show that they voted. Uh, these are the pictures of uh, university faculty uh, joining the strikes, uh, which is known as Civil Disobedience Movement, the CDM. So these are the pictures from the 8th of March, International Women's Day. So in the streets of Yangon and also in the streets of many cities, women use their uh, sarongs or longji um, as flags. No? So the feminist slogans uh, become front and center of um, the protest that day. So there are three groups of women that are most visible. So the one that I showed the CDMers, uh, and protesters. So, so remember the 10% of the country's population is civil servants and um, most educators and doctors working in um, the government are women. Their participation in the strikes bring the government services to a halt. Protesters, especially those in the countryside um, these days are mostly women. Rural and minority women, they might not be as visible as city protesters. And um, some of them, especially those fleeing from active conflicts, uh, might not choose to protest in the streets, but they are active supporters and the participants in the revolution, contributing financially, shattering the fighters, and more importantly, give moral courage to the resistant fighters that they, have, they are behind the cause. So the third group is the uh, women fighters and advisors uh, or the, uh, the strategy advisors in the resistance. Nuns, teachers, professors, legal professionals, they are all now on the front line fighting and teaching children in the war zones. So this is a picture of, uh, I saw, uh, uh, I think it's a police um, taking down a woman uh, Sarong or Longji from the code line. Uh, so these are the uh, LGBT um, protesters. This is a nun uh, pleading to the security force not to shoot. 
So they change uh, the very quick change uh, from anti-coup resistance movement to the revolution highlights that radical and fringe politics matter. Feminism has always been there, but only read, readable or readable, readable version or what the West could understand version of feminism was visible to the outside world. Fringe politics in the physical and metaphorical sense, that is the politics championed by the minorities that continuously highlight the inherent violence of the patriarchal military and the civilian state moved to the center during the revolution and feminism found alliance in this fringe politics because feminism itself has always been a fringe politics. Institutional violence born out of the militarized society, not individual violence, reproduces um, the individual. So individ institutional violence and the domestic violence um, reproduce each other and the first protected the second. To stop violence against women has been the central call for minority women activists, including Shens, Karens, Kachins, and Rohingyas. And to stop using rape as a weapon has been their campaign uh, for many decades. In 2021, the plight of minority women in the hands of the Myanmar army has been incorporated into a 16-day white campaign to raise awareness on violence against women. Women activism and gender equity movements together with feminism have progressed beyond any measures and feminists were no longer being accused of angry women being insecure in their womanhood. So the, the changes in the representations are captured by these two pictures. So this is a beauty pageant. Uh, so before the coup on the left hand side and after the coup on the right hand side. Now she is an active fighter um, and uh, left her career and everything and now spending time um, with the forces uh, in the liberation area. And also the Chin woman has been essentialized with their culture and being able to blow the flute with the nose. But now the representation of Chin women has changed. No? So now Chin women have been depicted as active fighters uh, like the one on the right. So these messages abound uh, so on social media these days. Uh, so there has been an emergence of new conversations. No? So this is a uh, online campaign on the 6th of November, very recent, no? It's a dress, not a yes, no? So, so these messages um, that one hardly saw before the coup, no? They're now uh, very visible and uh, being accepted. So also the CDM, the women on strike, the professionals on strike, they said that uh, um, the, we are inspired by pregnant women, old women, uh, and the new women. You know, if they are continuing the fight, uh, there is no way that we can uh, give up. You know? So they are finding inspirations uh, from each other. So these are the recent pictures uh, about the women's role and women's participations. Uh, so the the, the last picture is a uh, woman soldiers when they were not uh, fighting, um, helping and teaching children um, in the camps. Uh, so these are children uh, from the families uh, who had to flee their villages um, very recent weeks. So this is, uh, this is quite unprecedented because women in the dry zone, majority of Burman women were never active combatants. It is mostly the minority women who join their ethnic armed organizations. But uh, these Burmese women are now trained to be the resistant fighters. So they, uh, again, women led uh, protests um, a few days ago. So the 
violence in minority areas, these two uh, Kachin teachers brutally killed by the army, you know, they, they are, they resurface to remind people in, in the cities, uh, in Burman majority areas that, you know, the military has always perpetrated uh, the, these crimes in minority areas. So, so again, you know, the connecting uh, the military to um, the violence and uh, the, the, the use of the use of rape as a weapon. Uh, so now is used as a campaign slogan to unite uh, between the um, the Burmans and the Highlands. Um, so this is the um, rather um, and popular but very important uh, work by a group called the Rebels. Uh, so here, because of the emergence of the resistant forces, um, so the, the, the message on the left-hand side said that, uh, so you know, try to win the war and don't worry about your marriage. You know, my, I have a, a, a sister. So the, the woman groups pointed out that you know, this is very uh, misogynist uh, message. And uh, so to win the revolution by any means is not acceptable, that you should uh, take into consideration you know, women's rights, LGBT rights, et cetera. So, so to guide the revolution onto the right path, I think has been championed by these um, minority groups, the feminist groups, the LGBT groups. So the, uh, in the 2021 revolution, um, national politics has joined or rather made space for women's politics. What is remarkable is that there have been discussions about setting goals and ensuring revolutionary goals uh, must reflect those of the most oppressed, uh, including women and LGBT and all minorities, including Rohingyas. So that is not the, uh, the revolutionary success just for the, uh, the privileged, but also um, the least privileged and the, the most oppressed in the society. So the, the, the message like the group by uh, the previous one that I showed that revolutionary success could not be measured by what they could bring only for the privileged and the majorities, but only when the revolution can guarantee the rights and the dignity of the less privileged and the minorities and the most oppressed in the society, it is uh, just the real success. So in the midst of the revolution, visibility of the invisible and voices of the voiceless give hope to people that the society collectively is making progress. With the suffering and bloodshed that we see every day, there is some hope. In Myanmar feminism, um, it used to be that personal is not political, or rather personal is not made or cannot be made political. But the coup has changed that. Women and LGBTQ communities who had been active before are now capturing the political rapture to center the demands and highlight gender-based systemic oppressions. The society has also come to understand that the revolution with no parallel platforms to tackle these systemic oppressions will be a merely incomplete revolution. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, um, the lecture has ended and I think this is a such an inspiring lecture that have led me to um, many questions and interesting discussions that I see similarities between our this lecture and the previous ones that have been um, talked about in the lecture series, for example, 
uh, when it related to the land rights of women, women not having entitlement to land. I think Dr. Ya Jiao Li talked about the situation of landless women, especially in the rural area in China last week, right, in the previous lecture. And when, when it comes to the unpaid labor of women and how they are contributing to um, not only uh, the fair pay of women, unequal pay between men and women in the workplace, I think Professor Jiaoti Gosh also talk about, talked about that in the first lecture. Right, and uh, when it comes to the usually marginalized women, uh, in this case, not LGBTQ, but uh, Nayeon Kim from Korea will probably touch upon that in the next lecture when she talks about Korean feminism. But we have a previous lecture where the speaker, Dr. Resu, talked about the disabilities. These are also traditionally invisible women uh, trying to make their voice heard um, in, in, in the process. So although that this lecture is primarily about Myanmar, we do see a lot of similarities across Asian countries. Um, and I hope that um, audience who have attended the previous lecture, you're very welcome to make connections and raise questions. Okay, so uh, we come to the Q&A session. And as previously, um, as I said, although this main lecture will be, is already being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube, the Q&A session because we don't have the consent from um, the audience to upload um, the content that you ask and the discussions in between. So